let me ask you about a, a recent controversy in which you found yourself more as a window to understand some of your broader views, which was the praise you originally offered for Roger Waters um, with regard to his stance on both Ukraine, which he is opposed to in terms of the U.S. proxy war, as well as COVID. He was questioning a lot of the same orthodoxies you were. And then you ended up deleting that tweet where you praised him and made clear that the reason was because he had held views on Israel and Palestine that you didn't share. I want to ask you about the specific kind of divergencies that you have with him on that question. But before I get into that, why was it necessary for you to delete your praise for Roger Waters just because you disagree with him on Israel? Can't you praise him on Ukraine and COVID and then at the same time say, but there are other issues, including Israel, where I have differences? Why did you delete the praise entirely? Well, first of all, the reasons that I praised him uh, was because of his position on the war, the, his position on COVID, which I thought was very courageous at a time when nobody, and also his position on Julian Assange. Right. Uh, I, I disagree, um, I would say, fiercely with his criticism of Israel. And I'm not, you know, th there, are, there are enough people who characterize those um, political differences anti-Semitic that me endorsing him uh, felt like I was buying into that, um, you know, into into something that was that, you know, was abhorrent to me. I really disagree with his. I think Roger, like many critics of Israel, first of all, people who criticize Israeli policy should not be characterized as anti-Semitic. But people who apply a different standard to judging Israel than they would to judging an Arab country, um, I think then that you've crossed a line there. And I, I do think that Roger does that. You know, I've now looked at some of his stuff and I think, you know, I like I said, I do not think people who criticize that that people who criticize Israel policies should not be called anti-Semitic. But I do I do think that many people are applying where Israel's critics are applying a double standard. So just to be clear, when, when you were interviewed by Crystal Ball on Breaking Points, it became kind of a very talked about interview, particularly the part where she was disagreeing with you about your view on vaccines. We did a segment on this show talking about that interview and my main critique with her, who she and she's a friend of mine, was that I didn't have a problem with her disagreeing with your views on vaccines. Lots of people do. She described it, though, as a red line, which seemed to me her way of saying, I don't disagree, disagree with you here, but you're so far beyond the pale about an issue that I regard as so sacred that the fact that, you dis that I disagree with you here means you're basically off limits, like you're radioactive. You're not susceptible to consideration for support no matter what in a way that, say, Joe Biden wouldn't be. That's the impression I got when you didn't just disagree with Water Waters on Israel, but deleted the praise, namely, doesn't matter how much I agree with him. I regard him as a person who's so radioactive that he should never be praised under any circumstances because of his view on Israel. That's a red line for me. Is that essentially what motivated your deletion and how you view people like Roger Waters and those who share his views on Israel? No, not at all. In fact, I, I, I continue to admire Roger Waters for his positions on you know, for his courageous positions on the Ukraine, on Julian Assange, on COVID, but you know, uh, my because of the that issue is so sensitive and radioactive to people. I did not want to leave any any opportunity for people to misunderstand. Since apparently, I guess, as my understand it now, he's more well known for his anti-Israel position than probably any other position. And so me chain, charging me praising him without making really clear what I was praising him for and that I did not buy into his other stuff was a, a source of confusion to people that I did not want to leave up there. Fair enough. I mean, I think the reason why he's most known for that is sometimes the same reason you're most known for your views on vaccines, even though you have views on lots of other things, which is because a lot of times people look for ways to take establishment critics and kind of render them radioactive by focusing on the one issue they know people will be most hostile to. But let me let me ask you about the substance of the Israel position. Um, 
you know, you alluded to the fact that your family had long been supporters of Israel. That was kind of the standard Democratic Party position for a long time, still is. At the same time, Israel has clearly changed over the years. The demographic shifts in the population have made it a much more religious society, more right-wing society. And I think any honest observer in the region or anywhere acknowledges that a two-state solution, the kind of way that people justify defending Israel is now essentially impossible. There's way too many settlements in the West Bank and those people are never moving, those settlers. You'd need a civil war between the government and Israel to do it. From the position of someone who's running for U.S. president, would your view be that the U.S. should continue to provide billions of dollars every year in aid to Israel unconditionally, meaning no matter how they treat the Palestinians, no matter what it is that they become politically, or would you condition that aid on them treating the Palestinians more humanely and more fairly? Yeah, I mean, that, that, if that's a long and complex question. And I've been to Israel, I've visited specifically um, Palestinian settlements within Israel and in, uh, you, 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 however you want to call it, West Bank or Judea and Samaria. I, I've been visited, I've spoken with government officials there. I understand that it, it, it Palestinians are mistreated in Israel. I've seen, you know, the water allocations that were very, very unfairly uh, allocated to the new settlements rather than uh, to traditional settlements that have been around in some cases for, for hundreds of years. Um, in terms of the evolution, I, you know, I think if you, everything has a historical context in Israel. And if you look at why we don't have a two-step New state solution in Israel, which everybody now says they want. Uh, but both in 1947 and 1940, not 1947, 1948, and then again in 2001, it was the Palestinian leadership that walked away from a two state solution and, and pledged itself to the destruction of the Jewish people. Oh, and that, you know, that's a very, very clear history. And I think at a time when they had a very, very generous solution on the table. Now, you know, the other thing I say is Israel is a democracy, but it's a flawed democracy, just like the United States. But if I was a dissident Arab Palestinian, would I rather be a dissident in Israel or in Saudi Arabia or Oman or Qatar or any other Arab nation? If you're a dissident, you get up on the, in the middle of the public square and denounce the government, where would you rather be? You'd rather be in Israel because it's the only place you're not going to get in trouble. And uh, but and that does not mean that it's a perfect democracy. It isn't. It's very, very flawed. And I do not, you know, I differ vociferously with the the views of the you know the right wing religious right wing groups that have uh, in many ways been dictating policy in Israel over the next, over the last few years. I think part of the responsibility of the United States is to try to find a path to justice for the Palestinians. Uh, but on all these issues, you know, if, you're, if you live on any of these other countries you, and you're gay, for example, you can be killed for that. Israel is the only place where you have freedom. If you're a transvestite, if you have other kind of dissonant views, you much rather be in Israel than I, any other I, I place. Get, I, I get that argument, in it, but it, go, go ahead, go ahead. You can finish. All right. Well, I just wanted to. I just wanted to ask well, you because the, 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 that, you know Israel, the, you know the, the um, and and we need we need to have the same standard for judging Israel as we judge other Arab countries. We should, you know, and Israel Israel is is going into the West Bank and killing children. It's never doing that deliberately. Never. And nobody has ever said it is. Well, a lot of people, have, a lot of people, a lot of people have said it. A lot of people have said it is. But, but let me just ask you, because I, I just want to focus the question. In all of those other countries, it is the deliberate policy of those countries to attack and target civilians okay, and I, to kill them. Okay, so so let me let so me just I just I want to focus the question have, though, because you have the kind of abstract question that you're talking about, which is who's better, Israel or Saudi Arabia? And I don't think anybody would doubt you'd rather live in Israel than Saudi Arabia if that's you know the choice. Just like people say, I'd rather live in Ukraine. Than, I'd rather live in Ukraine than Russia. Um, Ukraine seems more democratic to me than Russia. But when it comes to Ukraine, I've heard you making the argument that even though Ukraine might be our ally, even though they might be more democratic than Russia, 
We have so many people that you speak eloquently about suffering here at home that this is a ward we can't afford. So if you were to go around the United States, as you're already doing and will continue to do, and the question is not who's better, the Israeli or the Palestinians. The question is why are we in the United States transferring billions of dollars of aid each year to a country, Israel, whose citizens in a lot of ways enjoy better standards of living than a lot of the ways American citizens live? What is your argument for why we should send so much money to Israel but not to Ukraine? Well, I mean, the, the, historically, that argument has been that Israel is a, is a model democracy in the Middle East. It's the only democracy in the Middle East. And as a democracy, it's, it's a model for peacekeeping, for, you know, for, um, and uh, there's never been a, a time in history when a democracy has, a, has gone to war with another democracy. So I think our policy in the United States should be to support the the growth of democracies around the world. Um, I, you know, if but, I, but that was I'm the argument for. But that was the argument for for going into invading Iraq. We're going to spread democracy in the Middle East. That's the argument for supporting the Ukrainians, which is the Ukrainians are a democracy well, no, and Russia is an autocracy. There, there's a and Glenn, I agree with you, and I think there. But there, I do think there's a difference between what we did in Iraq, which is imposing a U.S. system, which I don't think was really democracy at the point of a gun, uh, and you know, going in in a preemptive war, which we've never done in our history, on a pretext in which we lied to the American public about weapons of mass destruction and uh, and you know, and our policy of assisting an existing democracy in the Middle East that has had a long relationship with our country and a long and supportive relationship with our country. But, you know, I, I think you raised some important points. I think it probably at, at this point in history, um, Israel is, uh, you know, is much better able to take care of itself than it was in the past. And we need to look at all those things. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update. Catch our full shows for free live weekdays at 7 p.m. Eastern on Rumble and join our Locals community at greenwall.locals.com for all of my written journalism, exclusive after-show Q&As, and more.